Hello everybody and welcome to my ultimate and definitive Civilization V tier list. In this video I'll be ranking every Civ in the game. All of the DLC, all of the vanilla Civs, to try and figure out which one's the best. I'll be considering how balanced they are or versatile they are in reaching victory conditions and your feedback that you've provided on recent videos over the last year or so. Thank you so much for all of that. Now let's jump in and delve into these wonderful leaders and rank every Civ in Civ V. And in alphabetical order, that leaves us starting with America, the United States of. America, in my opinion, in Civilization V is not great. In fact, it's fairly dull. Uh, their ability isn't really that great. The site bonus is okay. Cheaper tile purchasing, again, it's fine. Uh, I don't think necessarily really that America really has any advantages until the Renaissance era, where they get their Minuteman. Now, this is probably their only strength. The B-17 is all right as well, but it does come very late in the piece. So its overall effectiveness is uh, uh, fairly limited. America's overall sort of bland approach, supported by their Minutemen, I think puts them in a fairly good stead for maybe a balanced victory, but in particular, of course, that domination, that more expansionist style of play. Generally speaking, this puts them with their lackluster traits and their, aside from the Minutemen, pretty lackluster everything else in a low tier. I'm ranking them a D tier. If it weren't for their Minutemen, that'd be an F. I could also see a case for C. I think that C or D is about right for America. I'll place them here for now. Arabia is a powerhouse sieve that I neglected for a long time. They're one of the strongest economies in the game as well, I think largely due to their fantastic unique abilities. Their desert starting bias makes them really good at what they do best. You can benefit from things like desert folklore or Petra, so on and so forth. Their overall ability though promotes a wide empire, an expansionist approach but with a powerful economy backing it up building caravans for your trade, etc. Very good. Their unique building promotes, again, this wide empire, providing a second copy of a luxury resource for each one improved near the city. Through excess money and luxuries, uh, relations with city-states, trade, of course, research agreements, you name it. Your religion spreads easier as well. You can see that Arabia paint a picture, a well-rounded, strong picture with faith and economy in their back pockets ready to whip out when they need them. Domination is also a strong option. As I've said, they're an expansionist, their camel knights are very powerful, and as you move through later into the game, double oil from their ability uh, can potentially lead you to have a much stronger late game army than others. Here we don't have a simple unique uh, unit like the B-17 for the Americans, but rather all of our oil woes are sold. I consider Arabia to be very good for diplomacy, for domination, and for science, where diplomacy is of course quite often a economic victory. I think that uh, domination maybe is a secondary one, and potentially, of course, you can even stretch through into science as well, because when you have economy, you have all of these things. I consider Arabia to be a top-tier sieve. For the time being, I'm going to place them at A, but later in the video, when we start to roll through some S-tiers, I may give them a slight promotion, but for now, they're an A-tier. Assyria with their wonderful siege tower is very powerful early on. Uh, I've turned many enemy cities <laughs> to my own, or dare I say to dust, using it. The royal library that the Assyrians have uh, does allow them to stretch slightly away from their militarist domination focus. It provides uh, some more experience to their units as well. The Assyrians' shortcoming for me, their sort of downfall, is the fact that they are very focused on early war, and in my opinion, they're unlikely to be necessarily even the best civ out of those early war civs. In fact, they're probably fairly average, if not below average, despite that being their main strength. However, that being said, rapid conquest early on is a very powerful strategy for the Assyrians. I, I generally think that they're best suited towards domination, potentially scientific, right? Domination, but with science in your back pocket. Again, their early focus uh, and, and real focus along the bottom of the tech tree does limit them a little bit. I consider Assyria to be a fairly middle of the road civilization around the B or C tier. I'm going to place them at a C tier for the time being. Austria is one that I potentially undervalued last time, and after playing with them a bit more, I tend to agree. Austria is a very versatile civilization. They also have a very powerful ability. 
From a base amount of 500 bucks, you can marry a city-state if you've been allied with it for at least five turns, essentially bringing it under your control. Kind of like Venice, but much uh, easier to use and probably more broadly stronger, more versatile than Venice by far and away. There are, of course, some nuances here, right? By taking it over, you remove its diplomatic vote, maybe slowing down your your path to diplomacy. The Austrian coffee house is very useful, uh, stacking potentially with other buildings and making Austria pretty well suited for, in my opinion, science, culture, and domination. Interestingly, (laughs) despite being uh, so closely related to city-states, when you take them over, of course, you remove their vote. So in my opinion and in my perspective, while the diplomatic victory is, of course, uh, possible, it's really not the one that you should be going for. I think that Austria is a fairly well-rounded, versatile sieve. Their unit, the Hussar, is entirely the same, and their coffee house, as I've mentioned, is decent. I rank Austria at a high tier. Now, there is potential for Austria to go nuts, but I don't think that they are innately by themselves, and it is for that reason that I place them around the A or B tier list rankings. I consider them to be at least a B. I'm going to put them at a low A. On reflection, actually, I think because of the uh, reliance on city-state locations, where they are, how many there are, whether they're good or not, probably limits them just slightly more in my rankings, so I'll bring them down to a B tier. The Aztecs are the cultural dominators, not because they'll necessarily surge to a culture victory, but because their ideal strength is domination supported by culture, generated by the fact that whenever you destroy a unit, you get a little bit of culture from them. Speaking of units, the Aztec Jaguar is good. It really suits their sort of early war culture generation strategy. Their trait carries over on promotion as well, so it does have some more longevity than other units in the game. In fact, quite a bit more potentially than others. The only problem with the Aztec building, while it's pretty good and potentially promotes you to go out far and wide supporting your domination victory, with that cultural background, uh, is that lakes are very rare in Civilization V, so it can be difficult to properly pull off. The Aztecs are a fun sieve to play, they are fairly strong, you're not going to write home to your mum about them or anything, but they are pretty good. I rate them around uh, Austria, but lower. Around a B or C tier, in fact, I think they're a pretty good example for someone who might be right in the middle of the road. Domination victory, great, supported by culture, but unlikely to be strong enough to beat a true cultural sieve. It is for that reason that I rank the Aztecs as a C tier, but a high one at that. JK lol, they're a B tier, they're good. Good enough. Someone who's a lot better than good enough is Babylon. Anybody who's seen a Civilization V tier list video before, or seen my more uh, elaborate, expanded versions of this one will know that they are in S tier. They're great for science. Domination can help you here as well, of course, because with a great uh, scientific base comes great units. The bowmen, the walls of Babylon are fantastic for early game defense when you're at your most vulnerable. And of course, you could potentially rush the great library, get ahead in the tech tree as soon as possible, but your great scientists, your academies will more than handle that for you. Babylon is by far and away one of not only the strongest, but also potentially the easiest sieves. Your early defense protects you and then you surge through for a science or domination victory in the later game. No more to be said, Babylon are brilliant. Brazil, on the other hand, are actually quite a bit weaker in the early game. It takes Brazil, in my opinion, in Civilization V a while to flourish. Of course, the Golden Age tourism bonuses are brilliant. Uh, increased output for your wonderful people, your great musicians, artists, whatever. Golden Ages and tourism, of course, lead you towards a a cultural victory. However, Brazil are a fairly balanced civilization. You could pursue most things, but you are, of course, uh, leaning towards that culture victory. The Brazil Wood Camp makes jungles, uh, I would say, pretty decent tiles later on universities, with science. Again, though, Brazil's main problem is just that they are, in my opinion, a little limited 
a little limited in the early game, and honestly, they don't have any particular abilities that really pack a punch. It is for that reason that I placed Brazil fairly in the middle of the row. I, I can't say too many bad things about them, but I also don't think they really compare to the Babylonians or even the uh, the potentially Arabians, Austrians of this world. It is for that reason that I rank Brazil at a uh, high B or a low C tier. That made no sense. I meant it the other way around. Next up, we have Byzantium. Byzantium is one of these all or nothing heroes for me. Potentially very strong, but generally really not. Their ability gives them uh, an additional belief for every belief type inside of their religion except for the Reformation. This can be absolutely massive if you get your religion first. Of course, useless in some cases as well. Your religion, your faith is therefore paramount to how you shape your victory condition. And without any unique building, we have to rely on our two unique units. Unfortunately, while they're both very strong, they're quite separate. They have very separate uh, positions in the tech tree and use cases. And what that means is that it can be hard to effectively utilize them both in a playthrough. At least that's my experience. I can get them, of course, but by the time I get them both and have them ready to use, it's often too late for them to be useful. It tends to mean that without a building and without at least one of my units, I'm already on the back foot. I do therefore place Byzantium, unfortunately, at a very low ranking on my tier list. But let me be very clear, they have potential to surge way high. So they're one that is actually really difficult to place. Uh, but in general, with my balanced view and my balanced approach, using common sense and thinking about the average map and the average playthrough, I think that Byzantium is a very low tier sieve. Sorry, you're an F. Carthage can cross mountains, and while it can come in handy in potentially some warfare, especially early warfare, it's just not all that useful and pretty dangerous. The Carthaginians, of course, do particularly well in maps where there's lots of sea, and they really struggle otherwise. All of your cities really ought to be built on the coastline to make uh, the most of your maintenance-free harbors once you've researched the wheel. And if you're not doing that, you're probably struggling. They have uh, unique units, or dreams, powerful ships, uh, and they certainly are. But after the early game, really, there's not a lot to shoot for there. <laughs> there's really little to go for with Carthage. I would recommend, generally, a diplomatic route using your economy or potentially domination, but it does rely on a good start. You are potentially an early game powerhouse, but only if you have your conditions lining up properly for you. It's therefore, unfortunately, that I will be placing Carthage uh, at, a, a, <laughs> at a, a low D or a high F. I'm going to place them at a low D just because, like the Americans, where the Americans have one strength, their Minutemen, in a specific point of the game, I think that Carthage also have a situational strength at a specific point in the game. Carthage, of course, more situational because they rely on the ocean. It's a close call, but I'm plopping them in D because of their early game power. The Celts in many ways are like a slightly more careful Byzantium. Their ability kind of helps you make sure that you uh, get your religion online in a good way. Their warrior is a very strong unit as well, but again of course here we see uh, two specializations. Firstly, faith and the faith bonus from keeping your forests unimproved. Eh, okay at the start. In my opinion, not really worth keeping later though, so it does trail off. Likewise, of course, their early powerhouse of a unit trails off very quickly as well. Uh, I often find that I just tend to not really have the uh, economic, I don't know if it's the tiles or the trade or the setup or what it is, but I find that my early economy tends to be quite weak when I'm playing as the Celts because of their sort of all-in nature at the start with the faith, with the units. Uh, their hall uh, is useful, for helping you conquer cities, reducing the unhappiness. This, of course, goes alongside their early religion and their powerful early unit. You'll probably want to take advantage of this and push for a domination victory. And in my opinion, it's really the most viable strategy for the Celts. Again, weaker economy, uh, faith-based victories, not an option. It does kind of limit you. I don't think your culture will be all that great either. So I would suggest the domination. And because they're fairly limited, because they uh, have a very high early game skew, I rank the Celts fairly lowly, but better than their Byzantium peers. The Celts are a low pick for me, but 
certainly not the worst. I think they could very well be the best faith and religion-based Civ in the game, and I tend to rank them at a C tier. Ah, China, a very powerful dominating force in Civilization V, although maybe not necessarily quite as good as the greats. Their paper maker adds gold on top of your science, on your library, something you'll be building everywhere, you'll be building it early. This thing generates a lot of good stuff for you. And of course, we can't forget, they have one of the most strongest units in the game. They're double attacking crossbows. Now the crossbow is already a very powerful unit, of course, it uh, transitions uh, along the same sort of tech pathways as the Archer. These units are very strong early game for defense, and of course, they can be used offensively as well. The Chinese are brilliant as a domination civ in Civilization V. Like, really, really, really brilliant. You have science and money to keep your technologies high, allowing you to unlock your units and fund them with your libraries. And then of course, what are you unlocking? Oh my God, it's the most powerful thing of all time. And couple that with stronger great general, more frequent ones at that, you can see a very clear picture painted here. They are however not pinned in to a domination victory only. I think that science is also a viable strategy here, although of course nowhere near as good. The ultimate power of the Chinese really makes me want to put them up very highly, but because they aren't necessarily completely widely balanced. You do, of course, need neighbors nearby to carry out an effective domination. It relies somewhat on the map, having land access, etc., etc. I'm just deducting just a couple of points and placing them at the top of my A tier rankings in this tier list. Sorry, Denmark, but you're just not good. Denmark uh, is unfortunately probably one of the worst civilizations in the game, likely to be ranked fairly lowly by me for the following reasons. Their amphibious strikes can be pretty good, uh, I, I will acknowledge, in certain situations. Of course, it's highly situational, but it can be. However, the upsides are, as I say, incredibly situational. Having navies and armies on Opposite parts and ends of the tech tree, you couldn't really pull them further apart, it does make it very difficult to pull together a cohesive uh, Danish strategy in comparison to everyone else. The free pillaging is nice, although I often find I'm destroying what I've got. It tends to lead Denmark towards a strategy of kind of crippling the enemy going nuts and burning everything down. The Berserker, of course, is a fine unit, but it becomes obsolete very fast. And this is a general theme for Denmark. The Norwegian ski infantry, the same obsolescent problem. Useful in a small window, difficult to access because it's stretched up and down the tech tree and hard to make proper use of. Both units do carry over their promotions though, so a nice little thing. But really, when you play as Denmark, you're unlikely to find success anywhere other than domination. Everything else is of course possible, but when you compare yourself to everybody else, you just don't have anything really that sets you apart. It is for that reason that I rank Denmark as an F tier civilization. Egypt, on the other hand, are pretty good and fairly flexible. I consider them to be actually one of the most balanced civs in terms of victory conditions and what you really excel at in the game. The obvious uh, stance that I like to take for Egypt is of course to spam wonders. Get your production up high and build those wonders, baby. Uh, Egypt can also take a fairly aggressive stance too, though. War chariots, of course, will help early on, and their burial tombs are fantastic for happiness. Maintenance-free temple replacements. Egypt also has a strong religious uh, ability. Not as good as some of the focused ones, but I think that religion, unless you're really going all in and hoping for the best, in Civilization V, and because of the way it relates to victory conditions, of course, unlike Civilization VI, really is more of a secondary benefit. And Egypt do this very well. It's not their one thing. They're not going all in. It's barely a focus for them, but they have a benefit there and it's useful. Of course, their wonder building ability helps with this as well. You should try and cater your wonders towards the victory condition that you're going for. Egypt are overall a pretty balanced sieve. I think that maybe they lean slightly towards a cultural victory because of their uh, love of wonders, but like I say, you can really take them wherever you want to go. They have power in most areas, and I consider them, like I say, to be a high tier, well-rounded sieve. I place them difficult <laughs> somewhere between A and B. 
I'm going to place them as a high B, controversially. But do note, of course, these tiers all sort of do overlap. An A could be considered a high B or a low S, and the same thing goes through everywhere else. Ah, Victoria, let us set sail. The English ship of the line will make England probably a absolute naval powerhouse. Of course, you do need access to the sea to be a naval powerhouse, so I'm applying a slight limit here, but they also have a longbowman. The English longbowman is like the ship of the line, but for the land. <laughs> These units are both incredibly powerful. You can beeline and focus on one if you need to, or, of course, you can easily and handily make use of both of them because of their positioning where they align in the tech tree. Later in the game, thanks to Brave New World, you'll get an extra spy, which can be useful as espionage uh, is sort of starting to be introduced into the game. But I argue maybe not quite as strong as those absolutely powerful unique units. Uh, England is, of course, therefore really focused towards a domination victory, an expansion victory. Your navy has extra movement. Your powerful ship of the line, supported by an incredibly strong longbowman, means that domination is your absolute friend. I've ha also had some success in uh, economic or diplomatic victories. Culture, science to a lesser extent. England, though, will be an absolute domination powerhouse and should have a very powerful uh, economy or diplomatic relations too, using your ability to generate money from war or your extra spy. I consider England to be a very powerful civ in Civilization V, a fairly well-rounded, well-balanced one, but with a real focus on domination. Their unique units are, in my opinion, almost unparalleled in their fields for what they do best. And having the ability to stretch across land and sea is very, very useful. And of course, you do it in one of the best ways. I consider England to be an A-tier civ. Ethiopia have a pretty good reach on uh, founding an early religion. Their steels help with this. You could pick up piety as well if you wanted to. I think that they are not quite as balanced as some, but pretty decent in that you could pursue a culture, a scientific, or maybe even a domination victory, but really it's culture and science that you'll like the best with Ethiopia. Peace is your friend. A small, tall empire will fare you very well. Ethiopia can be powerful in domination, but it is a little bit more specific, so I tend to not uh, rank them overly there. I think that Ethiopia is a very manageable sieve to play. They favor small number of, but powerful cities, Fairly easy to defend, good access to resources and yield. I consider Ethiopia to honestly be a pretty strong sieve. Uh, I've had a lot of good games with Ethiopia. I consider them to be a B tier. France, unfortunately, is penned in a little bit by its ability, which does make it pretty dependent on a few things, particularly, of course, wonders. Unfortunately for you as a French player, it does mean as a culture sieve, that is definitely focused towards the later game. Uh, Musketeer is a decent enough unit, but uh, again, you're probably wanting to play nice and it comes a little bit late. You then have the Chateaus, which are a good improvement. They will help with your culture, tourism a little bit later in the piece, but really, uh, while the French are suited for a culture victory, it's pretty hard to do anything else with them. You rely on your neighbors not fighting you and kind of leaving you be. You're a very, a very vulnerable cultural egg as the French, in my opinion. You're not particularly strong. Nothing that you have is overly useful. You need to try and focus on keeping yourself alive, building good relations, and then going for a culture victory. It is absolutely a good thing to push for as the French, and they're more than capable of doing it, of course. But you're just not that strong, and I'm just not that into you. I'm sorry, France. You're a D tier. <laughs> no, you're not. You're F. Germany are, generally speaking, a fairly warlike civ in Civilization V. Their Hansa will help you out with that, of course. <laughs> and uh, early on, you can probably get a fairly strong military online, playing through the German economy. The reduced unit maintenance throughout basically the entire game is very useful to help out with that. The Panzer, of course, another very good unit, but a little late in the piece, unfortunately. It's a shame we didn't have something stronger earlier to assist Germany in Civilization V. Germany is essentially 
are a little bit tied to the location of city-states on the map as well. This does make them uh, a little more nuanced, a little weaker. Of course, domination is what they do best. You may be able to push for a strong economy or diplomatic victory too. I, I consider Germany to be fairly middle of the road. But again, depending on the city-states, has the potential to be incredibly strong. However, considering their fairly balanced approach, I'm going to rank them as a fairly balanced sieve in the middle of the road at a B tier. Greece is an interesting one for me and probably one that I slightly undervalued last time. The Greeks have two unique units, in my opinion, again, slightly worse than having something a bit more useful in terms of a building, but it's all right. We've got the Hoplite and the Companion Cavalry, which are, in their defense, very good for early game conflict, but of course they become obsolete. Greece can generally pursue any victory condition it likes by buddying up with city-states, and it's very good at doing that. Benefits last for a long time. You keep them on board, you get their happiness, probably free units out of them. It's very good, but not game-breakingly good. For Greece, diplomacy is probably your best path to victory, but because you can buddy up with certain city-states, get different benefits on them, and hopefully maybe have taken out someone near you early on thanks to your strength, I think that Greece are a fairly well-rounded serve. They will suit players who like early war and peace for the rest of the game, which does actually tend to be me. So I may be a little bit biased uh, now on my new <laughs> reflection of Greece. That being said, I don't think that they're actually overly powerful. City-states, as we've just discussed by Germany, may not hang around a long time. There are lots of civs that can destroy them. It does make them a little bit more situational, and for that reason, I'm going to place them at a C tier. But don't get me wrong, they do have potential to surge up high. As you would expect, the Huns are all about domination. Horse archers will obliterate enemy units, Battering rams, useful for smashing down cities. Conquering, of course, with the Huns should be done where, where the Huns really thrive. This is in sort of the early to early mid game, I would say. You want to get in quick and take people down because once your units become obsolete, you lose that extra benefit. Early game warfare can hurt our economies a little bit and that can be quite limiting for the Huns. Their only advantage I've found outside of this incredible early game suggestion uh, early game power, early game, it's, it's much more than a suggestion, let's be real. Early game rolling over your opponent is the fact that you get um, a little bit of production bonuses off your pastures. Um, you can potentially look to sweep out and clear land rather than trying to take it, right? So there's more of a sort of push and burn strategy with the Huns rather than a push and hold like there might be with a lot of other civilizations uh, in Civilization Five and in particular. Uh, overall, I think that the Huns are good, but not great. You can't really push for a lot if you haven't taken things early on, and you will flounder. Therefore, they're a fairly specialized domination sieve, and I'll be rating them as such. They are a C tier, with potential to bounce in the odd game, I think. The Incan Terrace Farm is a super useful improvement. The Incans also don't suffer a movement penalty across hills, and hills are almost everywhere. <laughs> Their slingers are alright, sorry Civ 6 fans, um, but the good thing about them is that they do keep their promotions. Uh, the Incans can really go towards any victory condition they like, I've found, in Civilization V. They aren't penned into one way or another. I've had successful military campaigns, I've had diplomatic victories, uh, once I even went for science, Culture, absolutely a thing you can do here as well too, of course. Generally, they're a fairly well-rounded, top-tier civilization, in my opinion. I struggle to fault the Incans much, but also they tend to not have a super one standout feature that rockets them above the rest, but I wouldn't let that taint your opinion of them. You can set up cities fairly easily, roads between them, roads on hills, maintenance-free city connections, loads of different things you can do. Terrace farm to keep your people fed, build your units. Incans are a great well-rounded civ that I'd recommend players jump in if they need to play a solid A to B tier civilization. I'm going to place them at a very low A tier or a very high B. India favors a very tall approach, particularly early on in Civilization 5. Gandhi, the meme that is, would love 
to dominate you. <laughs> and domination is kind of an unorthodox approach, though, really. The Indian 7, Civ 5, in my opinion, is much more focused towards a peaceful game, naturally, of science and of culture. However, the ability, and it's a very interesting one because it has a negative aspect to it, that can sort of hurt you early on and really stop your uh, early expansion, therefore feeding into that peaceful sort of science culture approach. However, it is also important to note that the war elephant in Muggle Fort, while they're okay and nothing to write home about, but they could help you lead into that domination victory as well. Generally, unfortunately, India are just not that good in Civilization V. I think that they are absolutely a meme and quite a fun one to play, particularly for maybe something like a One City Challenge, uh, for those meme challenges. But overall, sorry, India, you're just not that great. I consider India to by no means be the worst Civ in the game, but just generally be one that's not altogether super useful. And I tend to place them around the C to D tier rankings. Indonesians are a very interesting one. They're fairly well balanced. You could pursue what you like. Their swordsman <laughs> is neat, sometimes very strong, roll the dice, sometimes very weak indeed. I think that India is, uh, Indonesia, I should say, getting my Gandhis confused, <laughs> uh, is pretty good at producing less useful things. Uh, faith, for example. A great, a <laughs> great note. Uh, however, like I say, a fairly well-balanced sieve doesn't really lean me towards ranking them particularly highly because they don't have any significant strengths that really set them apart from others. The only overall real negative to them, though, is the fact that Indonesia are, of course, highly dependent on their map to be effective, right? They're not a bad sieve. They're fairly balanced. You could approach them generally however you like, but they are incredibly map dependent and, and, and honestly, nothing special to write home about. They have potential to surge up depending on your start, and so there can be some amazing Indonesia plays, but by and large, not all that hot. I rank them a D tier. The Iroquois have sort of a natural defense in that they can move through their forests quickly while it'll slow down their enemies. The Mohawk warrior can also be of fantastic use in enemy lands. Um, the forests overall can be used to help you trade or establish your city connections. You are the people of the forest very much in the way that the civilization is set up in Civ Five. Uh, overall, I consider the Iroquois to be a actually a fairly balanced Civ. They have that start bias towards forest, of course, so you do sort of tend to pick up these benefits a little more than the average. Generally speaking, I've found that science or culture works quite well for me. I don't really like to go for domination. We tend to, as I say, be more of a defensive civ, although some leanings toward potentially sort of early to mid-game aggression. I don't consider them to be overall particularly strong at all is the downside. There's really nothing, again, that I'd love to write home about. However, their approach to victory is fairly well balanced. It is for that reason that I rank them at a fairly low tier ranking around the C or D tiers is generally where I place them. Japan are a very interesting one. They're a domination sieve, although arguably actually not that great at it. Their ability will help you fight longer and harder with some of your units, useful in a pinch, although not actually that strong, particularly as the game progresses. Extra culture from fishing boats and atolls is useful uh, early on, especially if you want to try and grab some policies early, maybe a wonder, a border expansion, but it's not that profound. It's really not all that good. The Samurai are actually pretty decent units. Uh, again, though, they become quickly obsolete, like many other uniques, unfortunately, because of their long swordsman uh, replacement, you can't upgrade them until much later. Being able to construct fishing boats um, is, of course, really a little bit of your saving grace in terms of generating early power. When we focus on late power, it's pretty non-existent. The Zero is a pretty terrible unit, altogether not overly useful, really only benefits other people, and I tend to find it's obsolete from the word go. Japanese are therefore not overly a strong sieve, and while they are catered towards maybe a domination, assisted by culture victory potentially, they're just not that great at it. I'm sorry, Japan. I love you, but you're really only a C or D tier sieve. I'm going to place Japan at a high D tier. We'll toy around with them.
Korea is a scientific powerhouse and Babylon should be worried. Although, arguably, in my anecdotal experience, Babylon do tend to be just marginally better. But we're really talking the best of the best here. The top tier scientific civs in the game. Korea love specialists and specialists are incredibly strong. Your scientific specialists are arguably one of your greatest strengths as Korea. Your units are useful on defense, but really not all that useful on offense. Turtle ships, for example, can't sail into the ocean. What are they afraid of? Huacha, not so good at attacking cities, but actually a pretty useful unit. The disadvantages of Korea, their units, therefore do make them both a defensive, uh, not necessarily powerhouse, but they favor a defense, but really a scientific powerhouse. Your specialists across the board will be very powerful, including your cultural ones as well. Don't turn your back on culture. Culture is your strength here too. Brave New World really helped uh, Korea find their place in Civ. Korea and Civilization V are absolutely brilliant. The wonder part of their ability uh, maybe not necessarily as useful as everything else that they deliver. However, we are of course looking at things like the Great Library or the National College, the Oxford University to really surge us ahead. Korea is an absolute science powerhouse and absolutely an s civ in Civilization V. The Mayans are a neat one that I slightly underrated um, in actually really most of my civ career. Uh, their unique calendar gives you great people. You can farm great people like Poland can farm cultural policies, essentially. So you're never going to be quite as good as Poland. Maybe you're Poland light. Overall, you have a fairly balanced approach towards victory, much like Poland. You will favor a scientific route here, maybe, but your balanced approach overall should see you through. Your great people can allow you to really surge up ahead and kind of pick out your victory condition. You might look to go for a scientific uh, match. You might look to bring in religion or the pyramids, cultural traits to assist you here as well. The Mayans do actually provide a very balanced and strong approach, and it is for that reason that I tend to rank them around A or B. I'm going to put them, I think, at a low A tier for this tier list. Wham! Mongolia, like the slightly more mature Huns if you're used to playing humankind, follow a very similar route. They love horses. And chivalry is your key technology. You can't really do too much as Mongolia, or at least you can't really thrive until you unlock that. Your bonus to uh, cavalry units, of course, very useful. The Kashyyyks are your powerhouses, taking down enemy units, taking down enemy cities. Although, of course, you will need some melee assistance to do that. Mongolia, strength absolutely lies in the Kashyyyk and it absolutely lies in domination. Your ability is all right. Of course, it synergizes a bit, but it's yeah, nothing to write out above about. Uh, increase attack strength against city-states. Again, not super useful. Your game plan here should be to go after your opponents and really make the most of your unique unit at the time when it's at its best. Domination is your thing. And I think that, honestly, plopping them in here, a good call. A good call. Morocco is a bit of an economic powerhouse, which does make them catered towards a diplomatic victory. However, I don't usually struggle with science or culture here with them either. They're a fairly middle of the road civ, fairly well balanced in your victory approaches. I like their defensive bonuses on their unit and improvement. Obviously, this does tend to lead you uh, more towards a peaceful route. You'll notice domination not very well suited for you here. You're a fantastic trade civilization. Money, money, money. Your desert start is somewhat useful. Uh, you should try and make the most of it, though, because, of course, the desert tiles by themselves aren't super hot. So maybe desert folklore or Petra, something like that to just help boost you up a little bit more. Morocco is a strong civ but not a game-breakingly strong Civ. I consider it to be actually pretty middle of the road. You can't go wrong with a Moroccan game. I place them at B. The Dutch, the Netherlands is next. Netherlands is an interesting one, again, around the middle of the road. I think that the Netherlands are actually very similarly to the, uh, to the Moroccans, suited towards diplomacy or culture and science. There are sea beggars, do make them a fairly powerful naval nation. Uh, however, I don't think that you can necessarily compete with, say, England 
in that naval strength, or indeed a couple of others, slightly weaker perhaps. You can opt to trade away luxuries early in the game to get gold per turn, a, a nice little bonus here, holding on to your happiness. The Netherlands aren't a bad sieve, but they don't really have a lot to set them apart, except for, of course, their polders, which are a very good improvement. It's difficult to necessarily fault the Netherlands on what they do. They're suited for diplomacy. They like tall games, culture, science. You're not going to be the sea powerhouse you would like, but your unit is decent enough. It's difficult to fault them, but I also don't think that they're actually that strong. I'm going to float around with placing them between the B and C tier rankings in this video because I think that they straddle this bar very well. A very middle of the road sieve. The Ottomans, however, aren't quite middle of the road. They're a powerful domination sieve. It really is probably the only victory condition you can viably push for with them every time. They have naval capacity, absolutely. The trouble with them is, though, even though you're basically a pirate on the seas, you can capture enemy uh, ships with any melee ship and have a chance to keep it, you just can't get off the ground fast enough. Your Janissaries, again, very powerful, absolutely, but a little bit late in the piece too. Luckily, they retained their uh, ability upon promotion, so a nice little boost there. Again, it's the issue of getting the Ottomans online with so many civs that we've already discussed who have early or early mid bonuses. It can be easy for the Ottomans to be swallowed up before they really show their strength. For that reason, I rank them at a D tier. With my Persians placed handily in the middle of the row, <laughs> I could easily move on. But no, Persia, what have you got to offer? Uh, again, another balanced middle of the road approach here. However, a much stronger focus on those golden ages. And it's actually that that slightly limits the Persians a little bit from perhaps reaching up a bit further for me. While it's not difficult to uh, bring on extra golden ages to extend or control them, it is a slight limiting factor. The Satraps Court will help you work towards that though, which is nice. I think that your balanced approach can also lean a little bit further into diplomacy here with the Golden Ages, chaining Golden Ages together. You can lean towards that diplomatic route, or if you'd like to make the most of your Myrtles, <laughs> Myrtle Immortals, uh, an early conquest could also be on the cards. I think they're a solid pick, honestly. Middle of the road at that though. As one of the best civs in the game, Poland, absolutely not middle of the road. A free cultural policy at basically every era, supported by a strong cavalry nation with stables to enhance pastures on your cities, and a winged czar that's a very strong unit in the mid game. A useful time to bring it online. Your free policies, though, are really what carries you through. Honestly, if you just had those and then some generic ass ability from someone else, you'd probably still be all right. Poland are fantastic, absolute S tier from me. Polynesia, a cultural combination from the Pacific, are a very neat civ, although arguably maybe not quite as good as the Maori are in Civilization V. Your six, your Maori warrior in Civ V, though, is a fairly decent unit, but because it's unlocked so early on, it can be actually difficult to make the most of it. Honestly, it's kind of like a better scout that carries its promotions through in a better upgrade pathline in some games, and that's unfortunate because it's unlocked so early. The Maui improvement allows you to really become a cultural powerhouse. However, it will maybe take a little bit for it to kick into gear, right? Especially once tourism and hotels are brought online. Uh, Polynesia really doesn't have a particularly weak uh, spot towards anything. They are well balanced, but of course, culture might be your favoured pick. The other benefit, of course, is your ability, that ability to really get out there and explore the world, to embark from the beginning, and you can use that to maybe pick up city-state bonuses or alliances or scout to find better locations, so a little bit of flexibility here too. I think Polynesia are a really nice, well-rounded B-tier civ in Civilization V. Portugal, while not as strong as they are in Civilization VI, is, as you would expect, an economic powerhouse civilization in Civ V, however not quite as strong as the greatest greats. What gives Portugal its edge uh, is, is largely pushing towards, I think, a diplomatic victory, therefore, that economic victory, right? The now rewards your exploration, a little bit of extra gold, uh, your Victoria, uh, and your ability as well, kind of synergize to collect extra gold and extra trade too. Having an extra copy of, of most luxury resources is entirely possible for you. Money, 
happiness will help any victory condition, and therefore you've got a pretty balanced, well-rounded, B-tier approach to a sieve in Portugal's in Civ 5. Rome tend to have a stronger lean towards domination, right? You are tailored towards having potentially either built or picked up cities that have very few things in them. Many small cities. Actually, arguably one of the uh, civilizations in this game that's better suited to play wide, whereas most are suited to play tall. You're powerful in the early game, of course, and you should try and capitalize on that. If you don't, you'll be roughly on par with everybody else as you move through. Easy, fun pickup for most players just like they are in Civilization VI, but maybe a little weaker. I rank them around the middle in the B tier, baby. Russia was the very first Civ that I played with in Civilization V. They are catered towards a domination victory, and they love strategic resources. Your Tundra start bias, unfortunately, is actually a bit of a hindrance for you. Now, of course, it makes sense. It is Russia's, uh, one of Russia's weakest strengths is its geography, but also can be its greatest, depending on the season and the fight. Uh, the Cossack is a great unit. It's a mounted unit. Bonus against wounded enemies. It carries on through its promotions. So you can have some powerful later game things here, supported, of course, by the fact that Uh, Uranium in particular, not a problem for you as you move through, right? Uh, Iron is, of course, found in the Tundras, so there is a little bit of a synergy there with your unique, but it does limit you slightly. I think that Russia are suited towards domination and really not much more else because of those lackluster tiles that you're probably starting with, except for your strategic resources. I place Russia... uh, sort of in and around the B tier. I think they're stronger than you might initially give them credit for, but they just don't quite have the legs to really stretch them up any higher than that, I don't think. The Shoshone, however, I rank very highly. Uh, in most Civ tier lists, you'll see the Shoshone ranked high, maybe a, an A tier. I think they're actually an S tier. I think their extra territory early on is fantastic. You can get so many extra useful tiles, resources, or just general yield. I think that expansion therefore happens without even thinking about it. The Shoshone cities will pick up territory really fast, which tends to help them grow faster. Their pathfinder is is really what sets them apart, though. Your ability to choose what you want to get out of the goody huts is insane. Get your population early. Upgrade them into stupidly powerful military units and run over your opponents. The Shoshone are not only very good, but incredibly balanced, therefore. Their riders aren't especially anything special, though. And that does limit them just a fraction, but I actually don't think it matters. The rest of what they do is so powerful and so balanced across the game, across the era, but particularly early, right? All of the benefits that you get are front-loaded right at the start of the game. And that means that you get their exponential gains forever. It is for that reason that I rank the Shoshone at an S tier. Slightly lower than the rest, if I had to really rank them. But absolutely for me, an S tier Civ. Siam is a very interesting one. They tend to lean towards diplomatic victory. Additional output from uh, religious, cultural, maritime city-states makes them somewhat useful. Their additional uh, culture gain can also maybe help you push towards a culture victory, or at least unlocking some useful things early on. Their what also, of course, helps with this. There is a religion underpinning to the Siamese Civ in this game. Uh, I have found, generally, Siamese can also try their hand in a more aggressive manner. However, because of a reliance on city-states, you have to balance that in the back of your mind. If you have your militaristic ones, well, that's all good. If you don't, it may be more difficult. Siamese uh, really tend to let themselves down, in my opinion, because they don't actually have any super specific focus. Yes, you have a little bit of culture generation from your what, and you have the city-state relations providing extra yield, that kind of thing. But by and large, there really isn't anything to set you apart from anyone else. City-states are positioned and and vulnerable uh, at best sometimes, although other times they're brilliant. So we can't necessarily factor in that they'll provide what we need every time. Siamese, therefore, are decent, but dependent on their on what's around them. And it's for that reason that I rank them a little lower than most at a low C. Songhai are pretty good at domination and not too much else. 
Although, that being said, you can make a little bit of decent money with them early on, particularly if you're taking encampments and cities, right? You'll get a lot of money out of that. Land units receive bonuses that can help uh, you fight over the seas, but really the seas aren't particularly a place you should be going. The mud pyramid mosques are good. Extra culture, faith, no cost. Nice, because we're going to need our money probably to be purchasing our units. Speaking of, their cavalry is pretty great if you can build a lot of them able to pick off enemy units fairly easily, and I've actually found them quite useful in fighting cities too, so go you Songhai. The extra money that we've saved and that we're picking up from raiding should help our military along playing as the Songhai. Potentially, again here, maybe also a pathway towards an economic victory, which is diplomacy generally, but by and large, I think domination is your friend. Songhai, probably not the best at that either though. It is for that reason that I rank them fairly middle of the road. You're joining your friends in the C tier. I would love to give Spain a C tier ranking. It's just unfortunately not something I can do. They are a low tier rank in my mind, but with the potential to be right the way up the top. <laughs> Spain are arguably not really even suited to any particular goal, although you can choose to go and fight your foes. And when I say particular goal, I'm thinking about victory conditions because of course on the map, your one goal and one goal only should be natural wonders at all costs. Your ability makes the bonuses from really any natural wonder simply amazing. Even the worst wonders in the game will probably be pretty good for you. If you can pick up the right pantheon or religion, you can really go to town. But of course, there are lots of cans and shoulds involved with Spain. Spain can also potentially have a whomper of a strong culture, maybe even science. Again, it depends on what the map delivers. Natural wonders are pretty hard to find in Civilization V, and it's unlikely that you'll happen stance upon many of them. This really highlights Spain's biggest weakness. It is absolutely all or nothing. It's for that reason that I'm ranking it at a D tier. It doesn't actually quite fall to the F ranking for me. It's close, but not quite. I think that you can make this work at around this tier level of making things work. The Swedes, Sweden and Civilization V, love to be your friend. Unfortunately, the AI may not always play ball with this. And while this is a mechanic that is designed nice, it seems nice in practice, it's really difficult. You need to be peaceful with everybody. You need to be friendly with everybody. An aggressive neighbor, and we've covered many militaristic neighbors already, won't really care too much for that, and that takes away a lot of your power. However, uh, a conquest game, a domination game, isn't entirely impossible with the Swedes. Generally, you can take a fairly balanced approach, but of course, diplomacy is your best friend here. Uh, your Caroline Carolians are great. I wouldn't even try and pronounce their Arthur unique, uh, but that will um, give you uh, extra great generals for city-state alliances. So there's, an, there's a, a need here not only to befriend the AI, but also, of course, uh, to befriend the AI that won't attack you, those city-states that kind of just sit there and don't do a lot. The main problem with Sweden, unfortunately, like the Russians, is that we have often find ourselves uh, in snowy places, and we don't really have a lot to lift us up out of that. There is no great benefit for us in the snow, particularly. Sweden, in my opinion, is a very weak civ in Civilization V. Sorry, Swedes. Venice is probably the weirdest civ in the game. <laughs> and man, I love them. I think they're a very powerful civ with potential to be right at the top, but absolutely, I'm uh, sorry, I just can't place them there. Venice has uh, potential to be a naval or trading powerhouse, depending on where you spawn. You, of course, must play tall. However, you could, if you want to, go wide by bringing in a whole load of city-states with your unique merchants and bringing them into the empire. It is, of course, reliant on where they are and what they have for that reason. Purchasing a city-state, though, as Venice is entirely free, right? Your great merchant of Venice can do it for you. So the risk-reward trade-off is actually pretty high. You're not really risking that much when you take over city-states, purchase them effectively as Venice, although you will weaken your diplomatic ability, of course, as you start to remove them from the world, potentially. 
It all depends. And there's a lot of dependencies on what other diplomatic players are in the game. Is Germany in the game? Are they fighting everybody? Is Austria in the game? Are they buying everybody or marrying everybody? Overall, you will probably therefore lean towards a balanced victory with diplomacy as your best friend. Economy will also be your best friend, as will trade. Venice is actually a very powerful sieve. You don't have to do the one city challenge with them by any means, but you are a little reliant, of course, on who you can take over if you're choosing to buy things. I think that Venice actually are worthy of a B tier generally. Their specialization weakens them a bit, but they're pretty strong and they could surge right up to here or right down to here. Honestly, they need their own list. I'm going to place them roughly in the middle, but at the higher end of the middle, I think they deserve it. And last but not least, Deserving of a high ranking, it's the Zulus. Zulus are built towards domination, and they do domination better than most. Their Ikanda automatically gives all units before guns, melee and mounted, I should say, uh, the Buffalo Horn promotion, extra movement, plus 25% flank attack, and extra ranged defense. This makes your early units strong, and not just one, but all of them. You can get further specific promotions as well, giving you more combat strength, flank bonus, range defense. The Zulus are powerful. Their only problem, of course, is that once you get guns, all you have left is your unique ability, which isn't necessarily what makes you all that good. It helps, of course. It's very helpful, but it's not your key strength. Therefore, you want to dominate early. Thankfully, as the Zulus, we have a much wider window to dominate early than most. We're not necessarily just reliant on one thing, and when we do it, we do it very well. I think that the Zulus are actually one of the best domination sieves in the game, uh, and it is for that reason that I rank them at an A tier, up there with the Chinese. And there we have it, everybody. That concludes my tier list. What do you think? Feel free to roast me in the comments. <laughs> I get roasted on most tier lists. But also, uh, in seriousness, do share your feedback because I read it and I take it into account. And as I play Civ 5 more, even though it's already 12 years old, I'll probably continue to make content on it as I move through. So it's always useful to hear your feedback. Uh, a few reminders at the end. I think that most civs could move either up or down one. A few that I look at in particular are civs like Venice. Uh, the Huns, potentially Germany, uh, also Austria for the same city-state reliance. Uh, of course, Spain and Indonesia as well, two others that have that real map dependency. So do use a little bit of common sense when you're picking through, picking your sieve, designing your game. I've tried to apply some general advice to these rankings, and hopefully, generally speaking, they're on par with the appropriate and definitive power of these sieves. Thank you very much for watching. And I'll see you next time.